Well, uh, good evening, church. Uh, once again, welcome to Wednesday night um, Bible class with Good News Church, where we are studying the Word of God, and we basically been going on topical studies uh, for the last oh a couple of months, uh, going through into the new year. We dealing with the issues that help people that uh, struggling uh, get into twenty one to twenty two, and challenging you to trust God and to. Uh, let him lead you and guide you into all truths. And one of the things that uh, the month of February, we know this is the month of that we celebrate black history. And I have to say, Anna, that black history is not one month. We ought to celebrate our heritage all year long. Uh, we just finished celebrating Martin Luther King's uh, birthday, which was a blessing. But we need to reflect and realize that as a people, we come a long ways and we have a long ways to go. Uh, but I think when we go back to uh, even the Black History Month and we are talking about that and more uh, this month. But yet when I realized that, that as believers, we really realized that as a people, uh, Afro-American or Black, which we want to be called for, when there were times of slavery, where they were on plantations, one of the things that uh, we were more conscious of God. You think of the uh, after the ne Negro spirituals that uh, they sang, uh, uh, were whether they on the fields, the cotton fields, and they were uh, looking for God to deliver them and carry them. Uh, the song of "Swing Low, Sweet Chariot" and um, songs like that. that, that we, uh, we have overcome that things that what we are as a people. And the reason why I may say this, let me say this because I, I don't want to fumble my words, is that when we were slavery and in oppressions, we trusted God. I believe the trick of the enemy have gotten to the point that now that we're out of the cotton fields, out of the plantation, and we have gotten to the point that yeah, on Sunday mornings, uh, we can go play football, we can go play golf, or we can just go to the hotels and go to breakfast in the morning. But as a people, one of the things that we did, and you look at in our culture, people went to church. As an Afro-American race of people, that thing we did, we looked for our God and cried out to our God. I believe the enemy has given us the point, yes, we have freedom, and you can worship Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, but I believe that we need to realize the same God that they cried out to when they were struggling and oppression is the same God that we need today to live in the freedom and the liberty that we are. Uh, so in the month of uh, February and actually this year, think about the liberty that you can, the, pe the sacrifice people have made that we can go to school, we can have jobs that we have, we can vote, and there's still struggles that we have. But it's all because we cried out to our God. Amen. Who is the sovereign God, creator of the heavens and the earth. So um, keep that in mind. I'm going to say more about each uh, week about our history. And uh, in our church, we're going to hopefully um, try to magnify that with our songs and uh, the life that we live. And sometimes we always talk about, you know, those that we know, uh, the Martin Luther King, the W.D. Boyers, and Harriet Tubman and all that. But I always believe that uh, the unsung heroes that we need to be talking about today is the mother, a uh, single mother who is raising their child, or the husband who stay in the home and help raise the child, that man who's going to the job, uh, providing for his family. Those are the unsung that we hear. Are the kids that are taking a point to take that education to a higher level, not just satisfying just getting a high school uh, diploma, but pushing on to college, becoming doctors and uh, changing society because now we have that uh, opportunity. So I want to say much of that, but I want to tonight, but I um, want to just, just take that time to share with you before we get into the study of God's Word. So the topic tonight that we will be talking about is a love that binds, um, and we'll talk more about, about that in a few minutes. But I uh, just want to welcome you tonight and pray that you will look forward to being with us through the month of February we talk about this subject. So without further ado, let's get into a time of prayer. 
And we want to pray because we know that this Omicron is spreading and numbers are going up and things like that. But uh, we want to um, look to the Lord to give us the, the healing, the direction, the comfort that we need, and to understanding of your word. Because he says, in all thy ways acknowledge in him, and he will direct our path. Let us pray. Eternal God, our Father, Lord, we thank you and praise you, Lord, for this opportunity that we come into your presence, Father, and we don't come on our own accord, Father. We come because of your Son, Jesus Christ, his death on the cross, his raising from the dead, and giving us now the right to come boldly to the throne of grace. And we come tonight asking, O oh God, that you will forgive us of any sins that I have done, we have done, and fill us with your Holy Spirit. That as we teach your word, Father, as those that are hearing your word tonight, O oh God, that they would not just be one that hears, but doers of your word. As we talk about this subject of love, realizing that's who you are. You are love, and without you, we cannot truly love. So help us not only understand it, but apply this truth to our life. And we be careful to give your name the praise and the glory. And all God's people said with me, amen and amen. All right. So the subject to this, uh, actually this whole month, and it's called Love That Binds. It comes from a, um, a series, or there, there was a conference that I started years and years ago that my wife and I, we would deal with the love that binds. And the love that binds, and I get into context and more of that, and it deals with not just a, a relationship, with our relationship with God, our relationship with one another, a husband and a wife. So often that we forget that there are single parents, there's divorcees, that sometimes they don't feel love. So this month, whether it's in my Bible study or in my preaching on Sunday mornings, we will deal with the subject that love that binds, that love that binds. And it's taken from the passage of Scripture, and those, I tell you that uh, for you, I want you to use your Bible uh, as we mourn up. So as I uh, start this here, I'm going to read the context of what you can take your Bible and turn to the book of Colossians, the third chapter, and I'm going to read the first 14 verses. It's not going to be on the screen because I want you to use your Bible. I'm going to use it at ESV, but if you have a King James, if you're going to have New King James, you can, I want you to follow with me as I read this. But I'm going to give you a chance to get your Bibles and turn to Colossians, the third chapter. And I'm going to be reading from the ESV, and it's going to be verses 1 through 14. It reads, If then you have been raised with Christ, seek the things that are above, which Christ is seated at the right hand of God. Set your mind on things that are above and not on things of the earth. For you have died, and your life is hidden with Christ in God. When Christ, who is your life, appears, then you will appear with him in glory. Put on, therefore, what is earthly in you. No, put to death, therefore, what is earthly in you. Sexual immorality, impurity, passions, evil desires, covetousness, which is idolatry. On the account of these, the wrath of God is coming. In these you once walked when you lived in them, but now you are to put off, put away anger, wrath, malice, slander, obscene talk from your mouth. Do not lie to one another, seeing that you have put off the old self with its practice and put on the new self, which is being renewed in the knowledge after the image of its creator. Here, therefore, here, there is not a Greek nor a Jew, circumcised, uncircumcised, barbarian or Scythian, slave, free. Here's, I love this, but all, but Christ is all and in all. Put on then, as God's a chosen one, holy and beloved, compassionate hearts, kindness, humility, meekness, and patience, bearing with one another, and if one has a complaint against another, forgiving each other as the Lord has forgiven you. So you must also forgive. And here's our key text. And above all these things, put on love, which binds everything together in perfect harmony. May the Lord have a blessing to his hearing and reading of his holy word. So I want to uh, say to you uh, tonight that... As we read these scriptures, God is saying something to us that I believe 
that we need to take to heart. And the heart is that love. And that love, love that binds. And think about that. When we say something binds, what holds something together? What holds life together? What holds marriages together? What holds churches together? What holds your relationship uh, with God together is love. And it's not so much of your love, but God's love for you. Because remember, Scripture said, we love him because he what? First loved us. So the scripture, the text that we're going to uh, kind of be the capstone of this study that we are talking about tonight is that um, the first, it's Colossians, the third chapter, verses 14. And it, and it reads, Above all these put on love, which binds everything together in perfect harmony. Let me read this again, just because what we just read in those 14 verses, this is a capstone. And here it said, Above all these, put on love, which binds everything together in perfect harmony. So the context of this passage of scripture, we found that Paul is writing to the saints that are in Colossians, which is located in Philia, in the Roman province of Asia, and which is in the northern part of Turkey, which we know today is Turkey. He's writing to them to shore up their faith because the, there was some false teaching that was crept in. We know that in the first chapter we talk about the preeminence of Christ. and But there was some false teaching that, which would say a wolf in sheep clothing. And he was dealing with the issue that we know that should be importance of sound doctrine. And not only sound doctrine, but living a life that stems from sound doctrine. And let me say this here because there are people who know the doctrine, who have the word of God, but they don't live it. Amen. And this is what Paul was reading here. So I will not go into all this and talk in the letter, but I want you to know that the subject matter together is he pulls everything together that has been taught in this letter in this one verse. And listen to what Paul said again in this verse. Remember what we read that uh, uh, put away lying and cursing and false and immorality and all these things. But he said, and put on the Lord Jesus Christ. So what he said now, you're, there's some taking off, Put to death those things in your life and then put on the Lord Jesus Christ. So when put it on there, he said, when you put on Christ, and he says here, above all these things he just said, and not trying to be legalistic or anything like that, he said, above all these, put on love, which binds everything together in perfect harmony. So 14 is Paul sealing stamp on the Christian life. Whether you are married, whether you're divorced, single, because of the death of a spouse, and you have not found Mr. Right or Mrs. Right, and you're, you're figuring out, what, what, is, what am I doing? And I tell couples all the time, or I tell single people who want to get married, not stop trying to look for Mr. Right or Mrs. Right, and just be right yourself. And put yourself in the love of Jesus Christ. So when we go beyond these things and put on love, which is another way of saying that, Everything else you do, showing kindness, being compassionate towards person, having a humble disposition, and all of this, have nothing to do if you don't have love. So having money in the bank, and the list can go on, or things that people try to have a successful life that say they have love. But Paul says love, and the love he is speaking is not love that most people are thinking about, that some... Feeling that, you know, especially that when a guy tells a girl he loves her, or he tells, she tells him to love, and that's what it's all about. That's not what he's talking about. It's not just an emotional feeling, but he's telling us the love that goes beyond a feeling, but really is the very essence of who God is. Because the love that comes, we're talking about tonight, and we're talking about the love that binds together, is what you're talking about. It's the very essence of God, who God is. So that's the reason why I say that uh, when the Bible tells us, be not unlikely yoked, if you are a Christian and if you accepted Jesus Christ, your Lord and Savior, and then you want to marry a person that who does not know the Lord, then what, you, what you're saying is that that person that can't love you because they don't have God. That's the reason why it says that what is, uh, other words, let me say this, what is right and wrong got in common? Nothing. Amen. So what I'm saying is that when you're going to love the proper love, you have to have God as love. And how does it know? Let's go to the scripture. 
The word of God tells us what love and true love is. He says here in 1 John 4 and 8, He that loveth not knoweth not God. Point blank. Let us say, He that loveth not knoweth not God, for God is love. Why am I saying that? If a person doesn't know Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior, then they don't know God. If they know God, they cannot love because God is love. You can't give something and have something that you don't have in you. Now, I know there's been many Christians that, uh, you know, are people that say they've loved the Lord and they're very unloving. And, you know, I have a problem with that. And the scripture does because that word means you're out of the will of God. If you're not loving, are you being loving that people? Are you backbiting? Are you putting them down? That's not of God. And we'll get into more of that as we speak here. But let me deal with this word love tonight. Because I want you to understand what God is saying to us by this. So this word love here that we're talking about comes from the Greek word agape. Agape love is self-sacrificing, unrestricted, unrestrained, and unconditional love. Let me say this. When it says God is love, and think about that. If God is love, this is how God loves you. It means that him self-sacrificing, he, he, he didn't love you because you did something. He sacrificed himself to show you his love. He said, when you were yet sinners, Christ what? Died for you. Amen? Then he said, unrestricted. In other words, God doesn't say, okay, I'm going to love you if you do this. No. It's unrestrained. He doesn't hold back in his love. It's unconditional. I mean, he loves you in spite of what you are and what you do. So agape love is a virtue that surpasses all others. And in the fact that it is a prerequisite of all those who have natural love and the natural love that we're talking about, there's three, which is phileo, storge, and eros. And I would deal with that kind of a more or less with tonight. But we want to talk about agape because love that binds is uh, agape, so un, that means sacrificial love, love that is unconditional. That don't mean that means you love somebody in spite of how you treat you, how they talk to you. You love them because that's the way God loves you. You remember He says that if somebody have done something to you, you forgive those because you ought to forgive others because your Father has forgiven you, right? So get in here. So may uh, let me say this: an agape a love. Is something that we need to understand too. It may involve some emotion. You can have agape love and emotional, but it's not truly based on emotion, but you can have emotion. But it always involves action. Let me say this. If you love, the love we have here, agape love, is a verb. It is an action word. You show it. Agape is what it is. As a matter of fact, it's the greatest virtue of the Christian life. It's an action. I just can't. People say, well, I'm in love. That's a noun. That means it stays there. But we realize in the 13th chapter of uh, 1 Corinthians, it said, love is patient. Love is kind. It doesn't vault in itself. It doesn't, it lasts long. It endures everything. So everything that you do, you see, it is an action. So if a person say you love, it's not just what they say. It's what they do. And this type of love is was rare during the time of Paul writing this because in the Greek culture, it's, they saw people being unselfish, self-giving, and willing to devote themselves to the welfare of others. They, they viewed that as a sign of weakness. But in the New Testament, agape declared to be the character that you and I ought to grow around. We ought to be loving people. That's what John writes, and he says here, God is love. God is love. And look, look, look what he said. Now, first, first John 4, 16. And say, now, Get to the point that I'm saying if you're a husband and if you're a wife, if you have a uh, fiance and are, are somebody that you're getting ready to marry, are you looking for in there? If you want a relationship to last, it starts with who? God. And I couldn't put that any less because it says here, here here's how you're going to make it work. God is love. And the one who de- abides in love abides in God and God in him. Point blank. I mean, John makes it very simple. You, you don't have to be a, a theologian. You don't have to have a doctor degree. It just said, first of all, it tells you who God is. God is love. Amen? So, and if you know God, if you have him as your Lord and Savior, he says, 
and that and one who abides in love abides in God. So in other words, because you're in Christ, you have love, and because uh, you have uh, love, you have God in you. And that word abide is that word dwell. It's, it's a word of permanence and being at home and dwelling in. It's just like saying, I live in this house. That means this is my home. In other words, love, God is love. And when you have love, love is in you. It, it, it's what holds you together. Amen. I, you know, I, I, I don't want to beat that drum too long, but loving should be a natural, it'd be a natural for the person. Let, let me say this here. This is a quote that I, I read here. Being loving is as natural to a Christian person as breathing is to a natural person. In other words, that's what we live. We live to love. Just as a natural person can't live without breathing. And then it says, but it is unnatural for a Christian to be unloving. It's still possible to be disobedient in the regard of love. So in other words, you can be a Christian but if you're not being loving, whether it's to your spouse, whether it's to your employee, to your church member, to your kids, uh, there, when you're here, you are disobedient to God. Amen. Come on, somebody. Because uh, we, we are Christians, like we were all saying, like, it, may, it may be the usher, it may be the pastor, it may be the deacon, and they treat you very unloving. It lets you know they are out of the will of God. Why? Because God is love, and the one who abides in love abides in God. And God abides in him. So the one that should be loving is God in you, not you trying to love without God. Amen. So just as is determined, uh, love is determined by the will, not by the circumstances of people. So it is not loving. Now, let me say this. If, you, if, a, if a husband fails to love his wife or she love him, it's never because the other person, regardless of what the other person have done. I've heard it, and many of you said that, I, I don't love you no more. Well, I don't believe that Scripture supports that. Because if you got God's love, you never stop loving. Why? Because God never stops being God. Amen? Amen. Whether that person uh, failed to uh, treat you right, uh, because love should be operating out of the power of the Holy Spirit. And love is a control by the will, not you. Now, romantic love can be a beautiful and meaningful if we find in many accounts of the scriptures that you'll see it, and we'll talk about it sometime this month. But it is agape love that God's command of a husband and a wife to have for each other. And, you know, I wouldn't then have a scripture in there. And Jesus says here in John, uh, the 13th chapter, he says, hey, By this all men know that you're my disciples, not because you come to church, not because you pay your tithe, not because you get baptized, not because you sing in the choir, I preach the pulpit. But he says it, but that you have what? Love one for another. Amen. The scripture goes even further than that. How, how do we know? We have to love the Lord with our God, with all our heart, our mind, our soul. But the only reason why you can do that because he first loved you. And I'm going to beat this drum hard tonight because I believe what is missing in the body of Christ is very loving. People that are loving, love, letting God love people through you. People that not your color, people that is not like you, people don't go to your church, people that's in sin. God loves sinners. Amen. I, I have this talk with my wife. We were talking about just the other day. I said, if God was here, Christ was here he would do very different than we are because we separate people because they don't, they're don't they not like us, they don't act like us, and they maybe do things that we're not different, and they may be sinners. But you know, God loves them just like he loves you. Hey Amen. Come on, somebody. You know, this is what we need to see. God is love. Here, but let, let, let's, let me go back to here and show you that it, it just kind of beat the drum in there because we're going to talk a little bit about the husband and wife because I believe uh, marriage is a suffering in Christian homes. And men, I say this to you because God holds you responsible of being loving to your wife. Amen. God created women to be responders. Just like we love God because he first loved, God, the uh, wife loves us because we love them. And then in turn, love their children. Look what the word of God says here in Ephesians 5 and verse 28. And it's two verses he said, Husbands, 
love your wife even as Christ also loved the church and gave himself for it. Amen. That's, that's what he said. Husbands, you know, he didn't say wives. He said, husband, love your wives even as Christ loved the church and gave himself in. So what did he do? He agape himself. God, Christ would say he sacrifices himself. I'm not talking, we've got brothers that were saying, I'll take a bullet for my wife in a minute. I'm not talking about taking a bullet. I'm talking about giving up your will for the will of your wife. Amen. Come on, somebody. In other words, putting her before you, your ways, what you want for her. That's what Christ did for us. Bible says, for God so what? Love the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. For what did he do? He gave himself. And when did he do that? In the garden of Simeon. He said, Father, if there's a cup, pass me. But he said, but not as what? I will, but thy will be done. Amen. Come on, somebody. So that's why God holds the husband responsible in the marriage. Because if your marriage is not working, don't blame her. Are you loving her way Christ loved the church? Amen. I read uh, Dr. J. Vernon McGee says that when uh, a husband would come in his uh, office and he want to counsel and said, my wife is not doing this, she's not doing that. He said, the very first thing you hear says, are you loving her? He, he don't call the wife in. He goes right to that husband and said, you love him because God made them responders. I mean, I know we're there 5%. And no matter you love them, they're going to be that way. But he says, God designed women to respond to the love of her husband. Then he says in verse 28 of this text in Ephesians, and this is what we teach also in marriage counseling. He says, so ought men to love their wives as their own bodies. He that loveth his wife loveth himself. So brothers, let me tell you here when I'm talking about love that binds. You take care of your body. If you abuse your body, chance to worry, you're going to abuse your wife. That's why he said, he that loveth his wife, loveth himself. But if you take care of yourself, you should take care of your wife. That is your responsibility. And then, let me show you how that God made her a responder. Let's go look at Titus. Titus, the uh, second chapter, verse 4. And if you're hoping to follow me, that you guys are getting this in your Bible, these are the only verses I want to have, there are a few verses that will happen tonight. But he said, talking to women now. Now, here's the objection of the responsibility of the older women. Older women who have husbands that love them are to teach the young women. Look what he said. That they may teach the young women to be sober. Here it is. To love their husbands and to love their children. The older women that have experienced this and their, their job is not to say, you know what he tell them? He didn't tell their wife to love their husband, but he said, it's the job of the older women. You that are married, you that have experienced the love of God, and love God of, the, of a husband, you ought to teach the younger women to be sober, clear-minded, and to love their husband and to love their children. You notice that in that verse, it is taught. The women are taught to love. But men, if you have God in you, you are you are not to taught to love. You have God in you. Amen? I, I, I know this right here. So the love that each other have is controlled by the act of the will through the power of the Holy Spirit. You can't do this on your own. It, in a strained relationship between a husband and a wife, or between, uh, it's never a matter of an incompatibility, but personal conflict always is a matter of what? Sin. In a marriage, and you having the problems, and the conflict is going on, it's normally about sin. Because loving other is an act over obedience. Let me say this. When there's problems in the marriage, it's not what they're doing. It's acts of sin. Because if you're a Christian and she's a Christian, you ought to love each other. And the Bible tells love covers a what? A multitude of sin. Yes, she may be doing what she want, you want her to do. He may not be doing what he's supposed to do. But you are, your love covers it. It doesn't give away with it. He's still going to have to be accountable to it. But you should not break up your relationship because of something they've done. Because God did not start loving you because of what you did. Amen. So, uh, and loving them is, so anytime you're not loving, 
and not showing love to your spouse and to your relationship, it is an act of disobedience. And let me just straight to say it. You in sin. You know, we say sin is, uh, we think sin is drinking and smoking and cursing and, and doing all those kind of things. But do you know not loving is a sin? Amen. You're out the will of God. You're disobedient. It's not that a salvation issue, part of the the text, but he's saying here is right here, love that binds. Amen. Which is why Paul, in our theme verse, when he said love is what binds everything together, the the King James says like this, says that it's the bond of perfection, meaning that uh, to be understood that love is the binding power that gives preference and completeness to what is happening in verses 12 and 13. So when he says in verse 14, love that binds hold everything together, what does it hold it together? Here's the verse. Here's what love holds together. He said, put on then as God's chosen one. You are. That's why you're in Christ. He said, he that have God abide in his love and his love abide in him and God and love in him. So he said, put on then as God's chosen one, holy and beloved. What, what holds that together? Uh, uh, your chosen one to be holy is love. How make you be loved of God? What is that? How both together is love. Compassionate hearts. You have compassionate with people, compassionate with your neighbor, compassionate with your co-workers, compassionate, that compassion that you want to show with people. What holds that together? Love. And what kind of love is that? Agape love. Kindness. What makes people kind is that love of God, that agape love. Humility comes from what? Love. Meekness comes from love. Patience, for bearing one another. And if one has a complaint against other, forgiving each other, how do you forgive each other? Because you love them. Amen? As the Lord has forgiven you, also forgive. And how do you do that? By love. Amen? So love the vines, agape love, that God lend you. And let me say this. You cannot do this in your own power. You need to let the Holy Spirit love people through you. God never expected you and I because we're human. We cannot do it. But that's what Paul said, that though we walk in the flesh, we do not war after the flesh. The weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but they're mighty through God through the pulling down the stronghold. Whatever. Just because you're flesh, don't like you act fleshly. Amen? We're spiritual beings, and we're the Holy Spirit to show love one to another. So to understand that how the love that binds and works in relationship, we ought to work. let it work in marriage. Agape, against it, is is self-sacrificing love and marriage. And it brings all those three other loves together. And this is the love that I want. I'm going to close with this one and just talk a little bit about these love. And this, like I said, this is all introduction. I want to dig more about you loving God, God loving you in a relationship. But I I think I wanted to start this tonight with let you know how God loves you. So we know agape love is God's love, self-sacrificing, unrestrained unconditional uh, love, how God loves you. We love God because he first loved us. Amen. And he says that well, when we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. He showed us his love. Amen. So, and then his love, he shed, he poured his love into us. Amen. When we accepted Christ. So you have, when you have God, you have all the love you need. You don't have to pray and ask God for more love. It tells us over in Ephesians 1 and 3. Brother, we've been blessed with all spiritual blessings in heavenly places in Christ Jesus. So in other words, when you cry, you have all the love you're going to have. Need. You got all the faith. You got all the mercy. All we need to do is exercise the love that's in us. Allow the Holy Spirit to love people through us. But sometimes we want to control that love ourselves. And I believe that's the problem. Instead of letting the Holy Spirit control us, that's why I said be filled with the Spirit Amen. And not be uh, which uh, are they're drunk with wine, which is dissipation. In other words, don't let nothing control you but the Holy Spirit. Even in your love relationship with your brothers and sisters and your husband and wife and your children. But here's, in other words, three definitions are here. We Agape love is self-sacrificing. It's God's a love that we ought to love one another. But out of that love comes three other love. And these love here you can do in the flesh. 
But if you're really going to put the, uh, have a love relationship in your marriage, in your home, in your family, in your church, you need all threes working together. The very first thing is that we find that outside of agape love is phileo. Phileo is brotherly love, where we get the word Philadelphia, right? the city of brotherly love, right? But this love is, is a kind of love that makes agape love enjoyable. I, I, I read that and I thought it was pretty good. And here's one writer said, Phileo love is having tender affection toward your mate. Most re- friendships are built on phileo love. Phileo, phileo love is that something that you see another person that draws you to them as a friend. And is one thing and is unconditional of agape, right? But you, you like this person because... You know, it's something about them. You just like to be around. They're friendly. And that, that's it here. It says, uh, so that's a phileo love. And, and, and people may, may irritate you, but you like to be him. And it says, uh, quite another thing to have unconditional love with someone who is tenderly in affection, which fail, phileo love. But tender affection of phileo love makes unconditional love, agape love enjoyable. If you have agape love and you have somebody who is friendly, you can, and this is how a lot of people will win to Christ. You have God in you and there's a brother or sister, you just be a friend to them. And how you befriend them, you can share the gospel because you're not judgmental to them people. And so I believe uh, this comes out, phileo comes out of God's love. And when he said, it's, he said, and I believe that came out of God. Amen? But flail love, yeah? God's desire for the husband and the wife is that they tenderly love, which means phileo. You know, as when you have a best friend, I'm like, you know, my best friend is my wife. Amen? I have people I associate with, it, but my best friend is my wife. Some people call that, you know, your, uh, your soulmate or whatever. I, I don't believe you can uh, uh, be in a marriage and your soulmate is some other person, some other friend you, you grew up with. No, I believe your husband and a wife ought to be their best friend. My best friend is my wife. Amen. And, the, and this way, that means we have a tenderly and affection one to another. And that means that you, uh, you overlook the other faults and failures because you have agape, but because they're your friend. The next, next love that we have here is what we call storge. Storge is a family love, family love. And this is love, it means it's, uh, a physical show of affection that results with a pure motive. That's the definition they give it. It may be a hug, a kiss, uh, another expression of genuine infection. Because males are different than females, it says in Matthew 19, Therefore a man shall leave his father and his mother and hold fast to his wife, and the two shall become, what? One flesh. That's storge. They mean they coming together. Amen? The wife usually needs that kind of love more than her husband. Amen? They, they need that uh, affection and that loving and that caring. That, and uh, if you, you uh, it's a different. Me, men, we are, you know, uh, one-sided. I'm going to get to that point when I start tell with eros. But uh, women, they, they want to be uh, shown affection. They want to be uh, cared for. They want to be nurtured. Men don't need that as much. And I talk about that in the service when I preach in uh, Corinthians and we talk about it a little bit later. But it's important for the husband to set aside his needs for his companion and meet his wife's need, which is affection. That's what storge love, family love. That's the family love when he said, uh, um, and, uh, when it says Titus, and he tells to young, older women, teach younger women to love their husband and love their children. That's story day. That needs to be taught. Now, and it flows it, and I just believe it, it works in God's hierarchy that God loves us, men, we love him. Because we love him, we love our wives. And because we love our wives, our wife in turn loves us and loves our children. That is God's design for the family. It's not that, and let me say this, women, and it's a thing to you here. Is that now when you get married, you should not put your kids before your husband. Amen. Our grandparents or whatever. Your husband is the one you ought to love first. That's God's design. And when your children see you loving your husband unconditionally, they will grow to love God. Amen. And men, you ought to love God. Amen. 
because God loves you. I, I can uh, really uh, beat that horse for a long time. But here's the last one, and then I'm going to close tonight talking about this love relationship. And let me say this. I, I know I'm not going to exhaust this subject. I'm just going to be very practical uh, talking about these things and try to put scripture with it because I believe a lot of us talk love, uh, but yet we don't exercise love. And that's the reason why we said divorce rates are high. We, we see that abuse of husband, abuse of wife, abuse of children is because we have a distorted understanding of what this love, storge love. But the last one is eros, which is sensual love. Then I say, this love is the one the men love. I say, women, they love that uh, storge love. They need affection and uh, uh, feelings and things like that. But men different, eros is sensual love is a fulfillment in the physical, sexual desires of a man and a woman. They both want to have It's a desire for a husband and a wife to show towards each other when they become what? One flesh. Amen. When they come together. That's the reason why God designed, uh, he, he designed man, male and female. Amen. Why? Because he says when they come together, they be fruitful and multiply. How are you going to do that? When you have sensual love, sexual uh, relations with one another. Amen. That's God's design. Here's a scripture I'm going to read to you. And it's, for those that hear it, and uh, I'm, it's, like it's not going to be on the screen. But I want to read to you a scripture that speaks of that because that sensual love, it lets you know uh, if you're in a married relationship and you, husband, you're not to be holding out on your wife and wife, you're not to be holding out on your husband about your sensual relationship. And especially if you have agape love and phileo love, you, you ought to be automatically. It should be uh, uh, unresponsive. It's just automatic. And here's what it says, 1 Corinthians. And for those that follow me, your scripture, to get your Bibles and turn to 1 Corinthians, the seventh chapter, and verses 3 and 4. And remember, I'm reading out of the ESV. Uh, so some of them have King James that read differently. But I like the word they use out of ESV. And it says here, give you a chance there. 1 Corinthians 7 chapter, verses 3 and 4. This is for husbands and wives. This is not for somebody who is a boyfriend and girlfriend relationship. This is not someone have a boo or you have a suit. Amen. This is not saying I'm talking about married couples. Amen. Sensual relationship. Because remember, sex before marriage is a sin. Amen. Come on, somebody. Yes, but here it is, married couple. He says, 1 Corinthians, the seventh chapter, I got a chance for you to get there, the third chapter, the seventh chapter, verses three and four. Speaking, Paul, read, read, writing to the Corinthian church who were having problems, they were writing, want to know how, what we do with marriage. When I, when I, if I'm saved and I have an unsaved wife or uh, when I get in my marriage, how am I supposed to deal with this? And he says, the husband should give to his wife her conjugal rights. And likewise, the wife to her husband. For the wife does not have authority over her own body, but the husband does. Likewise, the husband does not have authority of his own body, the wife does. What is it saying here? Is that when you get married in this sensual love, in this relationship with a married, you are obligated to fulfill your conjugal rights with your spouse your husband and wife. I used to think, and I used to say this all the way time, it was always the woman that was using this against the man. But I've been pastoring and counseling long enough. It's not always the woman who are refusing to do her conjugal right. Sometimes it's husbands holding out to the woman. And it's not that she had the physical relationship. It may need a kiss. She may need a hug. She just needs to sit down. She just needs to show, you need to show her affection here. He said, agape love pulls all those together. See, when all type of these loves are operating in the marriage, it is complete because it flows out of what? Agape love. That's why a picture of a complete marriage of a husband and wife is a good relationship when we see Jesus Christ and the church. That's why he says, husband, love your wife if Christ loved the church and gave himself for it. Everything for your salvation, my salvation, for us to live not and go to heaven, but to live here on the earth, Christ did for us. No matter what we've done, or not a matter of fact, how failures that we made, Christ continued to love us. 
Amen. I'm going to close with this story here and, um, and we'll pick this up on next week talking about something you can be with me on Sunday morning. We're talking about love also. And it reads, let me read this to you and we're going to close. In 1975, John Maloney wrote a book called Dress for Success, which became the fashion guide book for many people trying to climb the corporate ladder. Molly advice centered on the basic premise, always dress like your boss. Every day for work, for school, or recreation, we all have to decide what to wear. And even in the dress down 90s, people strive for the right look. But we must also make choices about another wardrobe, our attitudes and actions. If we claim to be followers of Christ, our spiritual apparel is to be far greater significant than our physical clothing. Take a look at God's dress code for us. As his chosen people, we are to clothe ourselves with kindness, humility, meekness, and long-suffering. Colossians 3.12, what we talk about. We are to demonstrate patience and forgiveness. And above all, we must put on, what is it? Love, which is the bond of perfection. End of quote. I can't say enough about that because I believe God is calling us to take off the grave clothes of sin and put on the Lord Jesus Christ. And God will be with us. God bless you. God keep you. I'm going to enjoy this subject because I, you know, I've been, uh, and I say this, and most of you all know me. Have been, if you see me, you usually see my wife, and we're usually always together. And occasionally we don't. But we are actually celebrating 45 years since we actually first started dating. Married almost, uh, going on 30, uh, 39 years, and coming up on Feb this month, this month actually marks, actually, wow, I forget that, is 30, 46 years. For 46 years that we started dating. And uh, married coming on 40 years that we've been together. And I say that because she's my high school sweetheart. A lot of up and down, a lot of heartaches, a lot of... Uh, uh, things that we've done, not right, not wrong, but that, you know what? But I believe when we started, God put together, we're not going to let men put asunder. Amen? Would the devil try to get in there? Yes, he does. In her, in me. But I say with this today, and I close with this with you, greater is he that's in us than he that's in the world. What do we have to love like God's love? The Holy Spirit. That's why he said, be filled with the Holy Spirit. That means be controlled by the Holy Spirit. When you control with the Holy Spirit, you can love agape way, phileo, storge, and eros. So until God come uh, be with us again, I'm going to pray for you as we close. Father God, we thank you for this time, Lord, that we talk about a subject that of who you are. You are love. And if we don't have you, we don't really know how to love. So, Father, we ask, oh God, and tonight forgive us, Father, if we have not loved the way we should. And, oh God, we ask, oh God, that uh, even as believers, we know we fall short, Father, of not being forgiving, not uh, being long-suffering, not being patient with our spouses and even our friends or even in the church and co-workers, Father. But, Lord, we thank you that you are not like us and that you are forgiving God. And even though we sometimes fall short, you continue to love us. So help us, Father, to love others as you love us through your power and your Holy Spirit. So until we come together again, Lord, we pray for that sinner man, that sinner boy, Father, who may not know you in the pardon of their sins. And maybe they're trying to create a relationship. And Father, they, the re real reason why it's not working is because they don't have you. And if you hear the sound and you hear me, tonight and you're watching, if you don't know Jesus Christ, your Lord and Savior, all you need to do is acknowledge and say, Lord, I believe that you are the Son of God. I believe that you died on the cross for my sins, and I believe that you rose from the dead. And Lord, I want to change, because you said if I confess with my mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in your heart that God is raised from the dead, you shall be saved. That's the beginning of salvation, and you will grow in the grace and the knowledge of the Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. So until we come again, God bless you and God keep you is my prayer. 
Have a blessed night. Continue to share us and like us on Facebook and subscribe us on YouTube. Remember, at Good News, we're having um, uh, in-person service. We have all these CDC rules. We're wearing our masks. We're singing a song. But I believe, as I said each week, it's time for the body of Christ to start coming back together. We are a body. The head needs the neck. The neck needs the shoulder. The shoulder needs the body. We need one another. That's why he said, forsake not yourself to assemble yourself together as a manner of some yet. We realize that God can deliver us from the Omicron, so coronavirus. So I believe it's time for us to get back to worshiping together. So until we come together again, God bless you and God keep you. And we'll see you Sunday morning. Have a blessed evening.